Well, thanks, Jerry, and let me join you in welcoming everyone here. Thanking, thank you for uh, agreeing to moderate this seminar this afternoon, the other panelists for, for also participating, the audience here and online for, for being here this afternoon, and particularly to acknowledge uh, at the right at the outset the authors of the chapters. This is an edited volume, the authors of the chapters. Two of them here, Lars Brink is here from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and he played a very critical role, is essentially a, a fourth editor of the book, uh, as, as you can imagine, but in his role at a public institution that precluded him being formally recognized as an editor of the book. We couldn't have the Canadian government uh, having veto power and approval over what we had to say, um, as, as, as those of you who work in government know is an issue. Uh, and then Cesar Coratone is sitting, I think, in the back of the room, was the author of the Philippines chapter. So welcome both of you and appreciate your being here as well. Uh, I have a, a daunting task, which is in about the next 20 minutes, to give an overview of the book, and in particular, to be sure that everyone in the room ha has some basic notions about this complex set of rules that the WTO has about domestic support, and then to present to you at least a smattering of the evidence that our 495 pages cover, uh, so to give you at least a flavor of what leads us to the kinds of conclusions we have and, and, and what evidence we draw about how this system has worked. So let me start very quickly with the agreement. To those of you who are very familiar with this, I apologize. For those of you who are not at all familiar, I also apologize because we're going so quickly that you just get a glimpse. It's explained more in the brief that's on your, ta on your uh, chairs and, of course, in the book. I have to mention that, uh, obviously. So the long-term objective of the Agreement on Agriculture is to achieve substantial progressive reductions in agricultural support and protection in order to uh, correct and prevent uh, distortions in agricultural markets. Now, this objective is intended to achieve a, a, a very important global public good, which is a reliable and an efficient world agricultural system of production trade. And I think we have to keep in mind the, the magnitude of that objective which is sought uh, by the WTO. Now, to achieve that, what do you actually get from the agreement? Well, what you get is a set of legal disciplines. And it can be a long gap, and this is what we explore, the gap between the legal disciplines and the objective. So the legal disciplines fall into two categories. One is a set of rules for how you classify different kinds of support and therefore how they'll be treated in the WTO. And the other is a set of commitments, as you see, that countries made on not only domestic support, but also, of course, importantly, market access and export competition. Now, it's within that broad framework that we're going to drill down and focus on the domestic support rules and commitments and how they contribute to the, to the objectives of the agreement. Well, it is... Uh, difficult not to get deep down into details and very precise definitions and policy measures and ways things are reported and what it means. So before we get into that and potentially get buried in that, if you will, for at least my part of the, of the presentation, let me give you a, list, a little idea of where we're headed and where we come out at the end. And Dave and Tim will comment more on this as, as we progress through the seminar and in the question and answer period, we'll get back to this, I'm sure. So here are sort of two points and counterpoints, which is where we end up at the end of the book. Domestic support disciplines have really provided only an imperfect, if you will, a very porous architecture for monitoring support and achieving the long run objective of the agreement. That's important, and that's what our book digs into. But despite that, there is the counterpoint that despite those drawbacks, the notifications do reflect important key policy changes, and the WTO is in fact, the most structured forum we have for discussing support levels and the only one with any legally binding uh, attributes associated with it. Secondly, on Doha, it would certainly tighten, if we, if we get a Doha agreement, it would certainly tighten and extend the rules, but it would make them more complex and more diverse among countries. Now, there's two caveats to that. We're not on the verge, as, as you may, all may know, that there was a good try this year at seeing if the Doha round could be brought to conclusion but it's not going to happen this year. So we don't have a Doha agreement yet, although we'll talk about the commitments that would be made under Doha. And the additional corollary is that there is additional clarification needed beyond that. Now, I'm going to go very fast through a couple of slides about the rules themselves. So the first thing is the ceiling, as most of you know, and some of you may not be familiar with yet. It's only one nominal ceiling on the sum of all the trade distorting support or certain types of trade distorting support that are provided to each product as well as in a non-product specific category. 
The ceiling is based for those countries that have one on the levels of support they provided in a historic period of 1986 to 1988. And there are four key categories of exemptions from having to count support against the ceiling that your country is committed to. One is green box measures, blue box measures, development programs in developing countries, and de minimis. Now, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with these yet, they will become clearer as we go through the factual evidence. But if I dwell on them now, we won't get to that factual evidence, so we're not going to dwell. <laughs> now, in what's called the current total aggregate measurement of support, so this is what I'll call the CTAMS for short. This is what each country reports the WTO, this is the support we provided this year, and it is measured against the commitment we've made not to exceed. Within that, there are two basic types of measures. One is what we would all think of as subsidies. I mean, this is payments to farmers that are related to production or prices. This is input subsidies. This is other costs to the government of running subsidy programs. Very clear payments involved, fiscal expenditures involved in these subsidies. The other part is output market price support. And as you can imagine, this would be a very important component of support for agriculture. Many agricultural programs set agricultural prices, ensure farmers of output prices. Now, here a key distinction comes in that turns out to be very important in assessing the extent to which the disciplines as they are in the agreement help to achieve the long run objective of the agreement. So let me distinguish at the bottom of this slide between the way an economist would measure market price support by looking at the difference between a current price as received by farmers in the domestic market compared to an equivalent price of that product brought to a similar point in the marketing chain that they might receive, say, in the international market. That difference, if it was positive, would be support for the farmer. And if you multiply that by the domestic production, you get a nominal value of all that support. The WTO uses, if you will, a more rigid definition of how it measures market price support. So for legal purposes of the disciplines, it's this WTO discipline uh, measure in red that is, important, is, is, is what matters, if you will, for the legal disciplines. And this takes an administered price, a government announced support price. It subtracts not the current price in world markets, but the price in world markets in this same 1986-88 base period from which countries calculated their limit on how much support they could provide, multiplies that by what's determined to be the eligible quantity of production. So I think you can see a gap can emerge here. Now, let me turn quickly to the actual commitments. I'm not going to walk through all of these numbers, but just make a few points. This is an abbreviation of a table that's in the brief that talks about the commitments under the agreement and under Doha. A couple of points to make. First of all, for the four developed countries and also for Brazil, a very small ceiling on the CTAMS that Brazil has from the base period. But for those countries, you can see the Doha round would bring down very substantially the amount of support that they had the latitude to provide under the WTO rules. It would bring down this de minimis percentage of the value of production. If your support for a particular product or in the non-product specific category is below that de minimis, you don't have to count it when you add up to see whether you're exceeding your ceiling or not. Those de minimis percentages would come down. For India, China, and the Philippines, they don't have any positive binding on their CTAMS. That's going to have an implication I'll talk about in a minute. Now, in the final column are, the new, are some new, one of the new commitments that countries would make under Doha. There are several, but I'm going to concentrate here on this, what's called overall trade distorting support, OTDS, overall trade distorting support, which is the sum of the CTAMS, which is already bound, plus any expenditures you make in these de minimis categories, which are not bound, well, except by the de minimis threshold, plus any expenditures you make in, in this blue box, which is payments to farmers, but associated with some supply constraining dimensions of the policies uh, with, with which those payments are associated. So that new limit, you can see those limits also come down on all three of those types of support very substantially compared to the one limit on just one element of that that we have under the agreement. Now, one final point on this slide before we move on is to draw, a, a, again, a sort of point-counterpoint between two aspects for the developing countries. One of the issues in the negotiations is that if you look at this OTDS, it actually leaves quite a lot of latitude for the developing countries, these major developing countries like China and India, quite a lot of latitude for them in the future to provide support. It doesn't say they will provide that support, 
Well, in the negotiations, what you're negotiating is the latitude, the space that countries have to do that. Now, look at India, for example. India would have $25 billion of OTDS latitude, exceeds that of the European Union, whereas we think of the European Union, historically, the European Union has had much more space and provided much larger subsidies. For China, this comes out about $80 billion. Their currency of notification is their local currency, so you have to use the exchange rate to convert it, but it's about $80 billion. So that gives the developing countries a lot of latitude, but notice that China, India, and the Philippines, because they don't have this binding on CTAMS under which you can lump some of your subsidies, on each individual product, they are limited by the de minimis thresholds. They can't provide, and to be consistent with the rules, more than the de minimis level of, of support for any particular product. Under the CTAMS, you, these, the developed countries who have that latitude have provided much higher levels of support as a percentage of product, value of production to some commodities. So this, these dashed lines here are a very tight constraint on the support to individual products or in the NPS category uh, of the developed countries. At the same time, they have a lot of latitude. I want to just to, to bring that contrast onto the table. Now, let's turn to the evidence. And this is why I've rushed a bit through the rules. And more of the rules will come out as we talk about the evidence. So this is a picture that replicates figure one in the, in the brief. It shows all of the OTDS support for these four countries. Uh, even though all the OTS support is not bound under the agreement. The bindings you see are the agreement binding on CTAMS and the, and the Doha binding on CTAMS. Those are, the, oh, those are the lines you see in this picture. Now, I want to walk through this picture a little bit, uh, and then we want to look at India uh, so that we've also brought the developing countries onto the table as we proceed with our discussion. Now, the first impression that this picture gives is that these graphs look different. I mean, the notified support from these countries looks different. And the policies of these countries have been different. But the differences in the policies are not as dramatic as the visual image that these pictures give. And that's what we want to talk through and, 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 and get onto the table here to start the seminar. So let me start with Norway. Norway looks in this picture like it has had quite a stable policy regime under the WTO, and indeed it has. In Norway, the farmers' unions negotiate with the government a target price. That target price becomes an objective of the government to manage its trade policies and its domestic supply management policies, such that the marketplace stays very close to that target price. Those are, for the most part, reported to the WTO as administered prices. That's applied to the full level of production in Norway. And so Norway reports something quite close to an economic measure of market price support. And you can see has not changed its regime uh, very much at all, if at all, over the course of the 14 years. Now contrast that with Japan. The picture looks very different. Japan decided in 1998 that it no longer had an administered price for rice. And so the rice MPS had been an important part of determining the level of its commitment not to exceed on domestic support, but suddenly no administered price for rice. And by the Japanese argument, we no longer have to report market price support under the domestic support discipline of the WTO. So all of a sudden, Japan is far, far below what was meant to be a constraint of some kind on its level of support. Now, the policy regime for Japan didn't change, just like it hasn't changed much in Norway, despite the two pictures. Japan continues to manage trade with tight import controls. It continues to manage domestic production with a, major, a, a substantial rice land diversion program. So these two pictures of market price support reported to the WTO actually are reflecting very similar policy regimes in an economic reality. The European Union, in terms of market price support, falls somewhere between these stories, in a sense. You see a, a, a sort of stepwise decline in the market price support, by the end, quite low compared to the early years. And corresponding to that in the European Union has, in fact, been some substantial downward movement in economic market price support at all, as well. So there is some correlation between the domestic support picture conveyed here and the economic market price support that would be relevant to the long-term objective broadly of the agreement. OK, let's turn now to payments. Another striking part of this picture, these pictures for all countries except the United States is that you don't see very many non-exempt subsidies. I mean, we thought this was to be binding subsidy payments, you know, subsidies to farmers. 
but neither Norway, Japan, or the EU provides very much in the way of actual subsidy payments that would fall into this category of not being exempt from the binding. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't any payments. We see clearly the blue box, these payments that are exempt from the binding, payments to farmers, tied to production, but a fixed level of production, tied to programs where there's also a supply control dimension. Both countries, large blue box payments, diminishing towards the end. Um, now, uh, for, the, for Norway, our analysts for Norway also point to a very nice, interesting little story about payments. Norway has a program they call the Vacation Scheme for Farmers. So if you're a dairy farmer and you want to not milk your cows for a month while you go out sailing or go to South America for the winter, they provide labor to replace you on the farm. Now, our, the, Norway reports this in the green box as a non-trade distorting measure, measures agreed to be not distorting or minimally distorting to trade. Our analysts look at that and say, this looks a lot to us like a labor subsidy. And if it's a labor subsidy, it would belong in the non-exempt measures. And this payment is big enough that even if it's non-product specific, in many of these years, it would go into the CTAMS, be counted, and push Norway over its limit. So you have to look in depth at the policies, the classification of them, what the country's saying, what you think of as an analyst. And this is just to illustrate the kind of point. We could, the book, we held story after story along these important lines. For the European Union, it, as it moved down its market price support, it started making payments to farmers. You see them first in the blue box. In the end, those were moved into the green box in a different category. The European Union reports now 30 billion euros a year of what they call decoupled income support to farmers that fits the green box category of not being tied to prices or production. Now, $30 billion a year will turn farmers in other countries green with envy for sure. Certainly American farmers would envy that level, $45 billion or so of direct payments from the government when our Congress is trying to debate whether $5 billion is too much. But so, so this is important, that this part of, this, the, the, of the payments that doesn't appear here is so large, and it highlights the importance of the rules that are set, the rules part of the disciplines, as to just what policies can go into the green box. There are specific rules for each category and those rules turn out to be quite important. Payments of this size certainly raise the question of whether they would have production or trade distorting effects. Okay, now Japan is kind of unique because it really doesn't make either blue box or green box or CTAMS payments to its farmers. So you might think, well, that's the end of the story. But Yoshi Goda, our analyst for Japan, points out that in 2009, a new government in Japan suggested we should probably, looking across our neighbors, so to speak, you know, we could adopt some of these policies. So they proposed payments to rice producers that Yoshi thought would probably be in the blue box. And they proposed payments to other crops that Yoshi thought would probably be uh, in, the, in this CTAMS. Now, under the Uruguay Round Agreement, under the current agreement, those didn't pose any problem for Japan meeting its commitment, given what it's done with the rice market price support. But under the WTO, uh, under the Doha Agreement, it's quite possible that those would violate the long-term Doha commitments on OTDS and also on the blue box, which is another com new commitment under the, under the Doha agreement. Now, what about the other countries in terms of Doha? And we're getting close to being done with these, and I'm going to have to beg for a few minutes because we have to put India up and at least talk about it for a minute. What about Doha for the others? Well, you see, with the EU's last change in market price support, which was eliminating its notified market price support for fresh fruits and vegetables, with, again, very little change otherwise in the economic impacts of its policies, it brought itself down below the long-term Doha commitment. So it's, in a sense, done if Doha commitment was what they needed to meet. Norway, as you can see, is going to have to do something different about the way it notifies its policies or actually the policies it conducts in order to meet the Doha commitments. The U.S. is probably one we know best. I'm running out of time. It's quite unique, and I think that's the point to make by this comparison. The United States is quite unique in its support regime for farmers. Unique one way is the dependence on uh, counter-cyclical payments that are higher when prices are low. So in some years, uh, the, the CTAMS payments jump up even close to the limit. Of course, in high price years like recently, that's not so. Unique in the sense that we have made large use in the United States of this non-product specific de minimis limit and put a lot of 
price dependent payments into that, you can see in this graph that if it wasn't for that de minimis limit, we would have exceeded our commitment in a number of years. Uh, you can see that we're very close to the Doha limit, both in terms of the CTAMS commitment, but also remember the $15 billion or so, $14 billion of overall trade distorting support, we're also close to that when you add the non-product specific in 2008. And so this is important because these counter-cyclical policies in various years, if we continue with those kinds of policies, could kick out a lot of money, and the Doha kind of commitments could be quite binding on U.S. policy. Now, you see one of the reactions is in 2008, we also tinker, if you will, with our market price support and bring ourselves, in fact, down a little bit further below the commitments that Doha would imply, and I think there's some writing on the wall there about how the U.S. would respond to tighter commitments. Let me talk just a minute about India because this is a global system we're talking about and the issues for developing countries are quite different. India is, is illustrative of, of quite a few of them. First of all, there are little stars on these notifications for every year since 1997-98. India has not provided a formal notification to the WTO of its domestic support since the ones covering those first three years. So our analyst for India, Munasami Gopanath from, uh, from the Oregon State University, had to do a lot of work to construct what we called shadow notifications, particularly in the Indian case, where he tried to say, given what the government has done, how might it report in the future? Now, have, so this issue of notifications alone, providing information about your policies, is a broader issue within the WTO. Now, on terms of the India ish, support in general, here I have all the support, not including the green box, not so much focused just on the trade distorting. Now, green box policies. It looks like green box is rising relative. The last column is 10% of the value of agricultural production, the de minimis limit for trade distorting support for India. You see the green box rising. A lot of that is consumer subsidies. India is reflective of the relatively low investments that many developing countries are making relative to developed countries in the production side of their agricultural sectors, public goods kinds of investments. Market price support uh, is reported as negative for India because their administered prices are below the fixed administered prices they claim from the base period. Starts out with a very large no negative number because they apply it to all of production. The second year they make a shift and say, well, that really only applies to the quantity the government actually purchased. So a very important issue comes up of what exactly is the eligible quantity when you're operating some sort of price support regime. Towards the end, those negatives become zeros in this picture. If we extend this picture out, they're starting to become positives as the, administ as the administered prices are being brought up in a higher price regime. So potentially some WTO discipline issues coming up for India because of this de minimis support of just 10% of value of production on each commodity. On the non-product specific support, India provides quite a lot of support in terms of input subsidies and investment subsidies to agriculture. A lot of it, report, it reports under this development exemption, which allows developing countries, but not developed, to take what everyone recognizes as trade distorting support, but if it's implied under this development exemption, it is not subject to the cap. So India reports higher levels of non-product specific support than China, the Philippines, or Brazil, uh, but it, it, this is not support that would be disciplined by even a Doha agreement because of the developing country exception. Sorry for going a few minutes long. I'll just stop there with the evidence put on the table and turn to uh, our rest of our panelists for some insights about it.